Thanks to the Talk Python team who sponsored this episode of the Engineered Mind podcast. If you want to learn Python and delve into exciting topics like data science, web development, or building apps, feel free to visit talkpython.fm slash mind to find your next level and get a 10% discount. Also, a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience and other interesting topics to educate, inspire and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host Yusuf and for this episode of the podcast I'm very happy to have Munishwaran Maheshwaran on my show. Munishwaran is one of the youngest computer scientists working in the field of deep learning, cognitive computing, blockchain and quantum computing. He specializes in disruptive innovation, new technologies and digital transformation. Over the past several years, Monishwaran has developed numerous projects using artificial intelligence, ranging from accelerating the diagnosis of schizophrenia to combating malaria using blood diagnosis. He has collaborated with several companies in the hopes of building a better world. Monishwaran has authored a number of groundbreaking books on technology, programming and innovation. He aims to spread the knowledge of computer programming and guide novice developers and children through his books and lectures. His book, C++ Simplified, has become an all-time favorite for teachers and students alike. The book uses a new approach to teach students the C++ programming language. Munishwaran aims to educate 1 billion people with programming. He believes programming needs to be considered as a primary language and should be taught to everyone. He has since fulfilled consulting mandates for leading international companies and organizations based in Europe, Asia and elsewhere. His project, The Neural Connect, uses deep learning to change the way humans interact with the environment and provides new communication media for people who can't communicate effectively. His other inventions include Project TAR Teaching through augmented reality, assistive technology for the hearing and visually impaired. He is currently involved in bringing the power of quantum computing to the hands of common people. In this podcast, we talked about quantizing emotions, making machines feel, suicidal thought management, and many other interesting aspects of his research. For updates on upcoming podcasts, projects and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter, engineeredmind.sh, where I share exclusive content, visit yusuf.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Monishwaran Maheshwaran. Monish, welcome to my podcast. Uh, finally, I have you on my show. It's an absolute pleasure. Maybe to get things started, just give a brief introduction to yourself, what you do, how old you are and so on. I'm extremely glad to be on your podcast, Yusuf. It's it's a great uh, platform, I would say. Uh, so, as you all know, Yusuf mentioned, my name is Monish Wan. I am 18 years old. Let's get that out of the way. So, uh, I started out pretty interested in computer science, to be honest. I started out opening up appliances just to look inside them. And computers fascinated me. Why? Because, for one thing, they do work. Second, you don't know how they do work, right? And uh, I, uh, at the beginning itself, uh, I was very interested in math and apparently math and computer science go really well together. So I started programming from really young age and uh, it, it, and I'm here so far. But, and in the middle, a lot of things happen. And one of them being uh, my curiosity got boosted up. But how? Computers. So computers have been a, a huge part or a huge influen influential item in my life. And everything that I do or don't do is somehow related to computers for some reason. And uh, when, I was, when I was about seven or eight, I would say, I created a program that would actually do something that would improve my life. And I entered. I didn't. I did not really think about the implication of computers on surrounding people until I reached uh, my tenth grade, where I witnessed the accident of a visual impact person, and that prompted me to look into the lives of the visual impact and do something for them. And uh, guess what? Computers came in handy, and in the end, I created a web. I uh, created a simple. A uh, device that would actually guide the visual impact using machine learning, uh, and uh, I, I had a couple more projects in the middle, uh, which we will be talking over in this podcast. Uh, 
And uh, another profound one was uh, related to suicides and uh, diagnosing uh, mental illnesses uh, using computers because computers are extremely good at finding patterns although I don't really consider them to be artificially intelligent. Um, I wanted to pick on the point that you mentioned about artificial intelligence. Do you think it's an own field? It deserves an own field? Or do you think it's, uh, because we talked about this earlier on, we have the same feeling that when you entered AI, you we were like, okay, you program crazy stuff and it's going to be amazing. And then you see, okay, it's linear algebra and some other stuff. And what, what do you think about that? <laughs> Absolutely. So... Uh, yes, I started out a program from a very young age and I did machine learning when I was about uh, around in seventh grade or something. And initially I was quite fascinated. It was like giving uh, something to you and telling you it's not work, but it's kind of like a magical wand. You, you swing it, you say something and it does things for you and it does them quite intelligently. And I was quite fascinated because how can you make a machine do something that a human being is supposed to do, right? So. And then, and then I realized when I came to college that it's not really uh, ML, right? It's not really artificially intelligent. So in 11th grade, uh, uh, I spent more time doing research in math, and uh, I, which was uh, during my college years, 11th and 12th. And it was, it was interesting to see that machine learning is actually not artificial intelligence or deep learning is not really artificial intelligence. They are just linear algebra and they're just linear combinations of the input. Uh, so that, that, that was quite shocking to me and getting to know more about what's going on inside made me realize it's not really intelligent. You see? <laughs> and uh, uh, the question is, how do you make it intelligent, right? How do you make it intelligent? Yeah. That's where my mm -hmm. current research focuses. And, uh, And everything is predicated on language, I would say, because the distinction between humans and machines uh, has existed ever since the beginning, right? But what's missing is how can a machine actually feel or how can a, ma a machine don't actually emulate a machine, emulate a human, but rather be itself and interact with the environment just the way we do, interact with us as well. And what are the consequences about that? That's what needs mm. to be pondered about. It's quite fascinating. Um, how do you want to quantize the, the emotions or how do you think in your brain, okay, I want to make a machine feel, but what's the idea behind it? It sounds so difficult, but yet so simple as a, as a thought. I see. So the distinction between humans and machines is most often made uh, in an, in an effect to describe the degrees of consciousness, right? Uh, so the, the main goal or the main distinction is of course predicated on language. The thing is, you so we humans, we think in language, we dream in language, we love in language. Language makes us human, right? I think that's what Martin Heidegger also said. And language is why we are who we are. And language comes naturally to us. And that is what differentiates us from other beings around us, right? Let alone machines. So we humans thus have the power to categorize, self-think, and also build a distinction between humans and machines, which is a paradox. Because we are learning something that would, in the end, lead to the distinction between humans and machines. And uh, in conclusion, to be human is to be in language, right? So when the question arises, How do you bring a human element to the machine? Huh? Or in another sense, how do you make a machine discover language? So from a huge problem, we have divided into subparts. And one part is how do you make a machine discover language? And machines are different, of course. They, they, don't, they don't think the same way we do. They have a silicon chip and they think using that. Uh, I mean, they don't really think. Uh, hey, in order to bring the power of language to machines, we need to first set up a proper criterion that defines a human outline. So the criterion being a generalization of what a machine can do, right? So we humans can do, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you say a machine is a human uh, based on what, right? So that's, that's the question. So the criteria being a machine should be able to do anything and everything a human being could. So it's a hu universe of human-like machine. And to make a machine discover language, 
we need to conform our thoughts to the tension buildup and release theory. So there is no better example to illustrate this with other than music, you see. See, the thing is, the music is a universal language that evokes memories, invokes emotions, give context to to our human life. So every music is some sort of, or, or informed art, at least in Western classical music, uh, the beginning starts simple, then you have uh, melody, then you have chord repression, and then you have tension build up, and then you have tension release, you have tension build up using dissonant or chordic chords, and then you have release when 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 you move from the, when you return back to the dominant chords, so you just return back to the home, or it just gives you a feeling of accomplishment, it gives you a feeling of happiness or melancholy. And uh, this amount of resolution dictates the emotional response, right? The more, more the more you're resolved, the more uh, uh, energy is pulled out of you, you are more aroused. So to fully understand the language, you must first quantitatively measure mm-hmm. our emotions. So we started with a huge uh, set, and now we de- dealt with a small subset. To deal with this smaller subset, we have to deal with another smaller subset called emotions. So it's kind of like recursively going inside. So, uh, so how do we quantitatively measure our emotions? So one way we process language is in this fashion, right? We we look for tension build up, tension release. For instance, uh, if if there is a person who who is whispering to you, uh, you might some somewhat guess or. First is you know that person is whispering to you and you, you subconsciously think, why is he whispering to you? But the biggest part is how are your emotions involved in making your decisions, right? So say, say there's a person who's shouting at you. So increased volume, uh, increased tension. So you know that the person is angry, of course, right? Or, or, frust- or frustrated or is unpleasant. So how did you make the correlation from voice volume to frustration or anger or unpleasantness? So so there is some kind of mechanism that is figuring out the uh, variation in, in volume or tonality and based on that is making meaning. So when the tension is not resolved, it results in anger or frustration or unpleasantness. But when it's partially resolved, it induces sadness, melancholy. And when it's fully resolved, you have a sense of completion, relaxation, or happiness. For instance, I play music for you, and then before it reaches the end, when you will feel the awe from the music, I stop the music. Then you would have the sense of, uh, I would say, unpleasantness, right? because something that you like has been taken away. So there is a correlation between emotion and music. Uh, so that could be used one of the parameters to see what's happening. So the various combination of these emotional states results in complex emotions also. Like uh, you, can, you can combine happiness, relaxation, or anger and happiness to create a vast majority of emotions. And moreover, this phenomenon doesn't just subject to music, films, uh, uh, literature, or even uh, a print, uh, or even anything that's uh, somewhat understandable has mm-hmm. emotion in it. So, yeah. uh, and I think it makes sorry. it somehow yeah. difficult to to build such machines because everyone has a different opinion on it. Because you could say, okay creativity depends on emotions or maybe vice versa and some people have a different opinion on that and based on that you have a different plan on how to build a machine how a human really works so it makes it quite difficult right i agree it is a very difficult problem but the idea is to take a huge problem subdivide it and find one dependent area which is completely independent but also Mm. being dependent uh, uh, I mean, the other the other area is being dependent on it, and if we crack one that particular area, everything mm. gets cracked automatically. So that's the goal, right? So we, 
I mean, a lot of philosophers have contemplated about language and how language uh, is present in our world or how we are using language. For instance, I'm talking to you, right? And you can listen to me and you can listen and you can comprehend it. So, and you can also listen to my emotions. I'm happy, you could say. Uh, and I can see you and you listen to your tonality and I can say that even you're happy. Uh, so, so the thing is, how do we know that? How do we even know that? How do we even sense that one person is happy or sad based on them talking to you? So, I mean, I mean, right now I, I, I can see your face, but even then, uh, if, for instance, if you t- take podcasts, for instance, and if you listen to a podcast, you will st- you would still know that the tonality of the particular interviewee or interviewer and uh, based on that, you can be a good, you can make a good approximation of how uh, or what kind of emotional state a person Mm. is in. Even print and literature can invoke emotions. And another interesting fact is we don't, I think, I'm not really sure if uh, people uh, who who are respected uh, or well-versed in the a field of emotions do think, but I think that everything around us is somehow connected to emotions in a way that even memory is connected, somewhat related to emotions. Because uh, when you listen to something, uh, it invokes memories, right? So I, I think it's more, more, more because the processing happens close to the amygdala, where the memory processing also happens, but I'm not entirely sure of that. So, uh, even even uh, going back, uh, even print or literature or art, everything invokes some some sort of uh, emotion. So, so this particular thing, language, relates to emotions, and emotions relates to humans. So all we have to do is, how do you make a machine discover language, and how do you make it? in a way that it also comprehends emotion just like us. So all you have to do is make a machine. There there are two possibilities. One, make a machine discover the language uh, by itself, which is going to be quite tedious. Uh, uh, The other thing would be is to give it subtle clues about tension buildup or tension release and make it respond in certain ways. Uh, but again, I would say that again isn't really uh, artificially intelligent, right? Because again, you are encoding something to it, but it should be more like self-discovery. Only then you can categorize it as intelligent or self-discovery is nothing but, I would say, somewhat similar to creativity. So... For instance, how do you, how, so taking the first approach, how, how would you encode emotion to a machine? So one thing is, for example, take, take uh, a easiest example, we, we take something uh, that's simple, like take uh, text, for instance. So if there's a paragraph saying, I whispered to you, and uh, you have, we have in, in language, we have exclamation marks, we have uh, other symbols, question mark, to, to denote some kind of emotions. But at least uh, right now in this world, we, we do have emojis, right? So, but uh, for, this, for, this, for the sake of this argument, let's forget that even emojis exist. exist. So if, if, I, if I just tell you, uh, I, I whisper to you, completely by itself, it makes no sense, right? I whisper to you what? Uh, what is the context? What am I whispering to you? What is the setting? What is the what, what, what does the person look like who's talking to you? Uh, so everything is based on context. So a sentence by itself has no meaning unless put into a certain context. So context plays in meaning. So right now we, we went from language to emotions, emotions uh, to uh, certain parameters. And from certain parameters, we figured out that meaning is somehow related. So what is meaning? Meaning is related to context. So every single statement or something that I make is somehow related to context. So if everything is related to context, so what is meaning? So 
the interesting thing is it's all about forming relations. So if you, if you take a particular paragraph and you read it from the beginning, and then you have this particular statement that says, I whisper to you, then it makes much more sense. You also know what's happening or what the setting is. You can form imaginations. And most importantly, you can form emotional connection with whoever or, 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 or the, the settings or, or even the protagonist, for instance, or the antagonist or some characters in that particular paragraph. So that's that's more like a spectator relationship that happens when you are watching film. Right? How do you know that you like a film, or why do you form such complex emotions with characters in a film? For instance, you, you, some, there are some people who who uh, watch films and are emotionally involved. They are somehow related to. They form a bond between themselves and the character that's why you know we ha we have fans right so uh, why does it bond exist is it is it because they can somehow relate to relate themselves to the character or is there something else going on something much bigger something like a spectator relationship so what is spectator relationship so it's more like forming a bond with a superficial context so you read something you are highly emotionally involved with uh, the reading. You see yourself in the reading. You are related to the reading. You're related to the character. You know the characters like you. Then uh, you see his, uh, for, for example, for instance, you see his uh, uh, hardships and you feel melancholy because you have endured certain hardships similar to that. So there's some kind of relations also existing. right? So relations form meaning. So all you have to figure out is how do you make a machine from relations now? So we have gone from a huge subset to something that's small. So that's easy. Forming relation, relationships is quite simple. All you have to tell, tell it is to see uh, tension build up and tension release, quantize it. But uh, the thing is, it, it isn't really uh, how we are, we are again trying to contact something which is kind of like taking the linear combination, right? There, there, there is no uh, unsimilarity between these two fields. So, but although although it is quite different, I, I wouldn't say it's the best way, but the best way takes time. The best way is to make a machine discover all these facts from, by just giving it language or, or try to deduce all these facts by itself, which is quite a painful process. But how would you where to begin? Uh, well, you could start somewhere. You can give it certain basic uh, uh, items or parameters that it can work mm -hmm. or work its way around. And we can make machines look for these subtle changes uh, corresponding to tension build up, tension release, the same way we do. We do something similar, right? We 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 try to see, we we build tension, we release tension. Everything that we do is somehow related to tension, right? For instance, so why do we take a Uber or uh, uh, an Ola to to your office, or uh, why do you order food online? Uh, well, uh, I don't think the second question is appropriate for a situation right now in the world, but uh, but mostly we do is to is to reduce tension, right? I don't want to go outside to get food. So I want to feel safe. I want to feel in a lower tension state or lower emotional state. I don't want to excite myself. So everything is quite based on the solid theory of tension buildup and tension release. So I think that might be one way to actually make machines comprehend mm. language as well as emotions. Um... Do you think that even below this tension build up and tension release principle, that the lowest level of this whole fundamental thing of building a machine is consciousness? Or is this even above tension build up, tension release? I see. So consciousness, I would say, um, is somehow, I would say it's kind of related to uh, knowing yourself, right? That's, 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 that's what consciousness, I would say, at least my definition of consciousness is that, is to know that who you are, know who you are, why do you exist, 
and what's happening around you and how you are interacting. You can touch, you can feel. So I would say even consciousness is somehow related to tension and attention mm-hmm. is somehow related to consciousness because uh, in order to feel or generate tension, you need to know that, and you need to know and accept that you exist as a real human. You're not some a random person uh, or on the world who doesn't even know that I exist or, or he or she exists or even knows that, uh, I mean, if a person doesn't know that he or she exists, that means she's not really alive, right? Or she's not really conscious. Uh, I mean, that, that even, even in dreams, I would say, people know that it's them who is in the dream. So consciousness, I would say, is quite deep and tension buildup or tension theory or even tension is related to consciousness and consciousness is somehow related to tension. And hmm, it's a good question. Uh, consciousness, I mean, a lot of philosophers have thought about consciousness, but... I mean, that's... I think... Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Most and then the question right? really is, we have all these theoretical views and thoughts about uh, how to formalize things and write them down. But when it comes to coding, how do you think this will, will be achieved? Do you think classical computing will be the way to go? Or do you even think, okay, maybe quantum computing could help here? Okay. Mm, classical computers, quantum computers, quantum computing is a good field right now. It has just begun. I mean, it hasn't really begun, but just yeah. gone more, more mainstream. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, to answer your question i think we should uh, let the users know what what's the difference between yeah, classical right. and a quantum computer is so a classical computer is like everything that's around you so far it uses electricity it uses transistors it uses logical gates um, to actually form the boolean logic or bo- and solve bo- uh, uh, solve interesting uh, add or multiplying problems and it uses uh, a bits or ones and zeros to solve or a parse data. So, and it does that uh, using just one or a zero, right? But uh, the, the, the big difference between a quantum computer and a classical computer is the cl- a quantum computer uses something called a qubit. A qubit uh, ha- uh, using, so using a quantum computing principles like superposition where can have two different states happening at the same time it could have one and zero which are two different states which are two different states in a classical computer but could be one particular um, one state which could be both one and zero so qubits can process way more information uh, faster expo- ex- uh, in the uh, most profoundly problems related to exponential growth so exponential growth is a huge problem in the field of computer science because uh, it's an NP problem. So it's a non-polynomial time problem. So if you have uh, something that's all, is a program that's running in exponential time, it'll, t- it'll tell you, uh, I mean, you, you'll know that it's going to take a huge amount of time to actually compute that problem. So we computer scientists generally avoid uh, exponential time. Uh, we, just, we really like polynomial time or mostly uh, log it's a logarithmic time. So this, this time complexity is, is, is defined as the amount of time uh, a computer or, or, or it, it doesn't really have the exact notion of human time or what time it really is, but rather the number of steps it has to take mm-hmm. to execute a particular program. And uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we have another field related to this. Uh, it's called space. Uh, so we don't like exponential space because it fills up memory, right? So... Uh, we, we generally hate uh, exponential time, but uh, if quantum computers are there, they can solve exponential problems uh, quickly. Uh, so they, 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 they can do something that a classical computer can't do. So how, how, how does this car re- is related to AI or, or artificially intelligent machines? Well, uh, we could have fast processing, that's one thing. Uh, but is is it? But if you notice, the human brain uh, is way more complex and uses a lot less energy to f- form or uh, solve problems of similar complexity. 
uh, unless it's just about number crunching. But I think there are people who who can who are really good at that as well. So, so the idea is quantum computers could definitely help, but quantum computers, I think, at the moment are still dependent on classical computers for input data and output data. But I would say probably in the next ten years we would have mainstream quantum computers, mainstream quantum computers, which means everything would be would be replaced or somehow uh, linked to quantum computing. So I think we're getting there. But uh, I think what I think is 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 forming the theory right now, and we could later test it using quantum computers because mm-hmm. quantum computers are highly efficient. And they can solve problems really, really, really well as compared to classical computers. And dealing pro- dealing with problems such as tension, or uh, or even forming, or ma- ma- making a machine discover language. That's that's huge amounts of combinations, right? That's clearly an NP problem. So yes, definitely classical com- uh, quantum computers mm-hmm. could be the way to go. But I think mm-hmm. we very still cool, have time for that. Cool. Um, we talked a lot about emotions, uh, Monish. And the next question would be, mm-hmm. um, maybe you can explain us what you did uh, at the Microsoft research when it went, uh, where you talked oh, about suicidal thought management. So, so suicidal thoughts. Well, uh, in eleventh grade, uh, it, it was quite interesting. I was I was more involved in machine learning, I would say, uh, the deep learning especially because uh, I really like deep learning because it, it, it's 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 kind of like a black box that you can fiddle around with, right? Something that you can't really know. It's a mystery. Uh, although although it's not artificially intelligent, but it's definitely quite interesting to fiddle around. And it's linear algebra. It's uh, it's it's math. So I was extremely fascinated by it. Thought to use it for something that's more profound. And uh, one particular part was uh, the amount of suicides uh, happening around the world. Um, suicide is such a big problem that uh, nearly every forty seconds there is a person dying due to suicide. So. How do you counteract this problem? We know that um, computers are extremely good at finding patterns, right? And they're much better than humans. I can say that. They're extremely good at finding patterns. And why not use this pattern detection system to detect what kind of emotional state a person is in? So again, this is somehow related to tension, build up and tension release, but every single human uh, has some some sort of characteristic equation, you see. Uh, so uh, what I mean by characteristic equation is not really the mathematical linear algebra uh, concept, but rather they have uh, subtle ways of uh, interacting with the environment that is somehow mm-hmm. related to their emotions. So for instance, uh, let's take an example. Say there is a person and he goes to work every day uh, uh, after taking a jog or a run outside. And suddenly, he's been doing this for a, for a very long time, and suddenly he stops going for a walk. He just rather takes uh, a cab or a taxi, for instance. So what happened? So why, why was there a sudden change in mood or change in behavior? Because we humans really hate to change, right? So... There, th- this could be one particular data point, right? Uh, the, uh, the change in the amount of calories burned. So, so the thing is, if, he, if, he, if there is some kind of emotional disturbances happening in his life, it could have an external manifestation. And one particular instance would be, say, say he got fired from the office, then he might be more uh, uh, present in, the, in his home watching Netflix or, or just uh, being there uh, depressed. So there is another parameter, which is the amount of interaction with the world. So, so we, have, we have around two or three parameters, but there could be more, and uh, some of them being uh, 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 the resting rate or your, your heart rate or, or, the amount of, or the kind of searches that you do when you're depressed, right? So well, what about using all these uh, patterns and try to deduce something out of it? So there is, we, we have found that there's a definite correlation between the emotional state and uh, the kind of uh, uh, 
work or interaction a person has with an environment and we have parameters and we can make a machine or train a machine to look for those particular patterns and we know machines are really good at that so oh you can you, you can can track changes that's happening and if there is a sudden change happening then that could actually alert the system and and if you are if 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 a person is trying to uh, uh, Google or go to a website regarding suicidal thoughts, that is a huge uh, boost, right? So that could alert actually that could actually alert the system, and uh, and it could recommend uh, articles or videos or media that would actually reduce mm-hmm. the particular emotional state or reduce or go back to the initial emotional state where he was way more joyous. But, uh, but there, there are, there, there are noises as well in this particular problem. One thing being, for instance, uh, uh, another interesting parameter mm-hmm. is the amount of sleep that you get, right? A person who is depressed might not sleep as, as much, as much. So that is another parameter, but, uh, this parameter can fire at us also. Uh, because uh, it has a higher noise level in the sense that, uh, say, there is a person uh, who moves to a different time zone, right? And that's a, that's a problem, and that's the noise. So if we have um, way more parameters, then we can reduce the noise level on certain parameters. And that's what that's what happened. And so far, yes, it's it's going well, but uh, I'm still working on it because I want to make it yeah. much better, I would say. So at the moment, yes, it is It is officially completed, but mm. I'm still cool. working on it. So there's a lot of work to do and you have so many interests, which is really incredible. So a bit like myself, I don't uh-huh. have... Uh, we all have limited time, of course, but uh, the, the really the, we have to focus our time on things that help other people as well and not use it for other purposes, like, for instance, mm-hmm. I know military is useful in some ways but we know that it might be misused sometimes <laughs> um where do you see yourself yes. in five years monish well um uh, that's a great question uh, because uh, i really hate to be in the present uh the only thing i care <laughs> about is the future <laughs> so uh well first thing is i want to build something i want i want to make sure that uh, i make a human-like machine that's one thing uh, the other thing, of course, to make sure that uh, uh, is is to is to make sure that every single person in the world I have yeah. touched somehow, uh, either either through knowledge or through uh, uh, some kind of uh, innovation. Uh, so that's another goal, and I've I've been trying to do that. So when I was in uh, around tenth uh, grade, I think uh, uh, a lot of my classmates really hated the current textbook uh, structure. You see, you have definitions, you have paragraphs, mm-hmm. you have questions, you have answers. Uh, so why not change that, right? Try to change that and see. So I wrote a simple book and um, made it online. Uh, and uh, it, was on, it was a book on C++ programming and it follows completely different structure. And people liked it. So uh, I, th- I think uh, one way is to, another way I would I'd say uh, is to, to, to touch people is by writing books or writing or, or, or making podcasts, for instance. And uh, right now I'm working on another book and it'll be coming out uh, a coming year uh, in, 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 the, in the fall or spring. And uh, it is about the theory that I've been talking to you about today. It's about uh, human-like machines. It's about emotional, the consequences. Uh, the thing is, Yusuf, once we have something like this, then we have a lot more opportunities to to think about. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, what what are the results of uh, this particular uh, problem? Uh, what happens when machines are re- tr- recognize emotions? Our machines are really good at forming emotions, or forming bonds. Well, the first big result is cause machines with personalities because we don't know how they discover or what mm-hmm. kind of variation they have. The second big result, of course, we have machines with, human, with emotions that can actually recognize emotions, human emotion, be themselves, have their emotions. Uh, the third big, big result, of course, machines with creativity. 
So what does this mean? Well, first we have to redefine and recategorize the idea of machine, right? For us, generally a machine is something that does work for us and does one particular kind of work. Second, of course, is to contemplate the possibilities of humans and machines co coexistence, right? Well, we know that science fiction has opened up our imaginations and given us the possibility, yeah. the if of the future and cinema and print. However, I think they don't really portray humans and machines truly. On films and novels, uh, human-machine coexistence is often exaggerated, although it's quite interesting, you know. Uh, so there will be major th changes happening, whether mm -hmm. we welcome those changes or not. But the biggest and most interesting change would be the ability to look at, converse with, form relationships with non-carbon-based life, right? And uh, the creation of the human relationship structure itself has an inherent loophole. The thing is the ability to add human characteristics to objects or, or, or even uh, pets, for instance. Why, why, do, why do we have a pet, right? Why do we have a pet? Well, we actually anthropomorphize the pet, right? That's, that's, that's why we have it. Mm -hmm. We have a human pet exactly. relationship. So this ability to anthropomorphize animals is the foundation for the human pet relationship structure. Then how about a human to human relationship structure? We, we know that exists. We also have spectator relationships with uh, uh, cinema characters or novel characters. So we, it's safe to say that that object with whom we have some kind of relationship yeah. could be anything, right? It could be pets, it could be characters, or it could be intelligent machines. So we thus form human relationships with machines and we would have some kind of a huge mm. change happening. Uh, the first intelligent machine that you built, Monish, will it pass the Turing test or will it fail the Turing test on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good take. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, Turing, Turing thought about machines in a different way. Uh -huh. He called them state machines. Uh, I would say the Turing test, mm, it's, it's a good test. It's definitely a good test. I think uh, if it's uh, definitely intelligent, it has to definitely pass the Turing test. But the interesting thing is, how do you know that, that it's actually not a human, right? Not a human. <laughs> How do you, you know, I can tell you that it's a machine and tell you that, take this test, tell me if it's a machine. And what if it turns out that, yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely human. That's what the person says. And, uh, and, 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 and yeah, so it passes the Turing test, but what about that, that we get confused that it's not really a, a machine, but rather we get confused that it's a human, <laughs> but it's actually a machine, right? So that's another thing that's happening, you see. So uh, uh, Turing has his own views on machines and uh, I don't really particularly conform to any views for that matter. But uh, for instance, we had Haskell, Haskell Curry, who, who thought about uh, 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 machines as just as uh, function solvers. So he represented numbers using functions. For instance, so the, uh, number one could be function applied to an argument once. And number two would be function applied to a function applied to some number or some argument. So two different uh, views on machines. We have uh, Curry's view. We have uh, we have uh, uh, Turing's view. Uh, in fact, uh, it's it's quite interesting, but I I don't really conform to any one of them. Thing is, I want to form something that's new, something that's completely independent, something that's different. You know. And uh, I think that's 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 what uh, Nietzsche says as well, right? It's it's all about uh, mm. not being a creative genius rather than being a herd. Uh, don't be a follower, just be a leader, or or be be, be different, or be mm. be like mm. Beethoven, right? Yeah, uh, I I like uh, Western classical music, music especially Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven's pretty good. Mm. He's from Bonn, right? So. It's interesting. That's uh, yeah. I like that you mentioned this creative uh, geniuses thing from Nietzsche because especially in those times where everyone has the, some of the same opinion on this kind of uh, medicine issue, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's good maybe to have some different mm -hmm. opinion on that and, and have always a discussion to be open for new things. Um, do we have a favorite AI yeah, movie? Exactly. And if not, 
do you want to create your own AI movie, namely in life by building your own AI machine? Um, sure. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, 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 like I said, uh, movies, cinema don't, don't exactly portray uh, the uh, mm. uh, artificially intelligent machines and humans together properly or they're often exaggerated. But uh, the first uh, film that that uh, I watched that was somehow related to computers or AI was uh, terminated <laughs> to not, not the good side. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it was a very long time ago. Uh, it was when I was around, uh, I mean, I think, I think it was around mm. when I was a kid, maybe. I mean, the movie is pretty old, right? But uh, it's, a, it's a good movie. It can make you think. Uh, the other movie that I really liked was uh, uh, Blade mm -hmm. Runner, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, that gave me uh, uh, an interesting view on life. That's that's an, another interesting. The thing is, I, I like films, and I like films that are different. I like the films that uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, refrain from watching. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, the spectator relationships uh, do happen. And uh, I think uh, around 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 a month ago, uh, I wrote a research paper involving uh, films. Uh, it was about uh, uh, relations and meanings. And where I said that, uh, for instance, you see, you see, if you take uh, in, in one particular language, you have a particular word, right? And the same word might have different meanings in different languages. So if there's a bilingual person, how does he know that there's uh, multiple words for one particular word in a separate language? So there's some type, some kind of uh, uh, transformation happening, right? Mm -hmm. One word to another word, another word, or one word to multiple words, and it's clearly yeah. not one to one. You see, so I mean, <laughs> I somehow related to related it to the Jacobian for the transformation because it's kind of like mapping. Uh, of one area to another, uh, but it's it's interesting, and the, the thing is, it's 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 uh, completely uh, consistent in a way. It's it's it transforms to certain set of words in the, in the uh, uh, code domain, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. Uh, meetings and relations are pretty fun. Cinema is pretty fun. Uh, the thing is, uh, we should we shouldn't just focus on the mainstream movies, but rather rather on movies that actually. Uh, have a lot of effort mm -hmm. being put into it. See. Last question for yes. you before we wrap things up. Do you think the singularity will happen? And if it happens, are we screwed? Or is there a, a light at the end of the tunnel for us humans? <laughs> 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 well, that's a great question, Yusuf. I know a lot of a lot of our users would also be thinking about that. This guy is <laughs> trying to create the singularity. Well, <laughs> well um, I, I, I think uh, uh, the singularity would be I think I think most people think negatively yes. about singularity. The thing is, uh, we have an intelligent machine. It's somehow going to think and outrule us, kill us all, make us make make us slaves. Well, I I don't think that's mm. going to happen. I don't know why, but uh, just my intuition, I would say. But my intuition has been wrong. So <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I think I think my opinion on this would be that uh, no. Uh, I don't think I don't think people need to be afraid of the singularity. Nothing is going to happen with that. Uh, yeah, it's it's all about having having someone like you to converse or talk to or have have some kind of relationship or or make them yeah, yeah, yeah. help you in a way, right? The, the idea is uh, why 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 do why do we why do we form human relationships? It's again based on emotions, but. And and everything is predicated mm -hmm. on somehow language. So people talk. Yeah. People have to talk, right? People have to talk, and that's how information is passed from one person to another. And the idea is uh, singularity uh, kind of pushes everything out further. It's 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 a highly exaggerated idea of machines taking over humans. But uh, again, why did we think about that? Right? Why why did we think about that? Why did we imagine something like that? Uh, why, how, how did we imagine, right? It's another question. It's another yeah. research area. It's another curious thing happening. So can a machine imagine that? Can a machine actually think that this human is going to overthrow them? Same thing, right? Same idea, reverse. So I would say I'm, I'm a bit ambivalent on this uh, uh, topic. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, or, uh, I don't mm -hmm. think anything of like that would happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think people would be afraid of it. 
but um, but again, we definitely need to think about it in a different way, but rather than just going for the obvious. Uh, yeah, yeah. Worst case scenario. I'm, I'm, with you there. I'm a bit also a bit ambivalent, but I think AI has a lot of potential for us to to em- embrace humans and make them smarter and so on. So, uh, but I think we have this this dystopian exactly. view of of AI being cruel because it's the same with the uh, like atomic bomb. Mm-hmm. You know, Oppenheimer would have never thought maybe that his research would have contributed to such a like mass murder. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it's, a, it's in, in the nature of human. Exactly. It's good that you also mentioned uh, dreaming in, in the podcast because dreaming research is exactly mm-hmm. saying that if we dream, we dream some oftentimes or most of the times of our fears. C- cats do this, for instance. They don't learn mm-hmm. how to catch a mouse. They, they say they dream, cats mm-hmm. actually dream, and they dream of catching a mouse or being afraid mm-hmm. of something. It's kind of kind of interesting. It's 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 so interesting. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I know. I agree. The thing is, Yusuf, like uh, the thing, the idea is, what will happen when machines have uh, yeah. the potential of being a human? The thing is, if if if, for instance, I'm working right now. I'm trying to write or trying to type. But uh, if there's if there's someone with me that will actually do all that work or all that menial tasks then I will be engaged with something else, something much more interesting, right? Something that's uh, completely different, something that a human can never do at this stage, but will be able to do once there's a human like him that takes over all the menial tasks. He has huge amounts of time. He or she has huge amounts of time when, when machines take over menial tasks, right? Like even, even moving from one place to another, uh, I can make a machine do that for me, right? Take a printout, take, write something, make food, make, um, do, uh, wash the clothes. Everything uh, a machine could do. And we wouldn't even move one particular inch. And we have huge amounts of time. And w- what are we going to do about that? We could concentrate on something that we can't do right now. Right? We have huge amounts of possibilities. For instance, when we had the Industrial Revolution, people never thought that uh, it would accelerate their growth that quickly, right? And uh, people were initially quite awestruck based on uh, the industrial revolution. But in the end, it turned out to be a better for the whole mm. of humankind, right? Mm. Even, even for computers, for instance, uh, who would have thought that uh, computers would uh, be so dominant in this particular world? Be, be humans. For instance, I just realized I have, it, I have not looked at a phone for a while. I have been completely engaged with computers and I haven't even for a split second gone out or, 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 or even stat, not stat at a computer or a phone. So at this moment, we are completely dependent on computers. Who would have thought about that? The thing is because of computers, we have become better, right? We have become smarter. Our IQ has increased. Uh, for instance, uh, technology has definitely improved our IQ. I think one research study said that. And, uh, so what will happen when we have something that's just like us who has who have replaced us? We have huge amounts of time and we can concentrate on something else, something much, much more yeah, interesting, much more exciting. Brings. I hope it will bring the best for us. And let's see. Monish, <laughs> thank you so much for being on my podcast. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm sure we could have like talked about other topics for more two hours or for several hours, but um, mm-hmm. maybe we'll have a second second part of the podcast. Who knows? Thank you, Yusuf. It was, it was, I'm, I'm extremely glad that uh, this happened. I'm extremely happy. I'm extremely delighted Thank you so to be much. On, on your Take show. Care. Thank you.